right, here we go. Welcome to the 2020 Town of Gilbert Mayoral Candidate Forum, sponsored by SRP. I'm Sarah Watts, President and CEO of the Gilbert Chamber of Commerce. We're so pleased to have your viewership as we take time to get to know our mayoral candidates, Matt Nielsen and Bridget Peterson. And thanks to both Matt and Bridget for investing their time today in this opportunity as we learn more about who they are and how they would each serve the town of Gilbert. I believe an educated and informed vote is one of the most significant ways in which a citizen can shape the future of their community. As such, our time here today will be well spent. Before we get started, I want to take a few minutes to recognize the sponsors of today's candidate forum and our entire Good Government event series. Please provide a virtual round of applause for SRP, APS, Arizona State University, Dignity Health Mercy Gilbert Medical Center, Higher Grounds Roastery and Cafe, Isogenics International, Willett CPA, Foundation Insurance Services, and Withy Morris PLC. Thank you for your support of Chamber Programming. It's my pleasure to introduce Linda Brady, Senior Government Relations Representative on behalf of our signature sponsor, SRP. Linda, please take the floor. Thank you, Sarah, and your team at the Gilbert Chamber for offering today's forum. I'm honored to represent SRP and join you and the other Chamber members for this event. As Sarah said, I'm Linda Brady and I am SRP's Local Government Relations Representative for the Town of Gilbert. For many of us, it's not often that we get to hear directly from candidates running for office. And that's why SRP is proud to sponsor this event and appreciates that the Chamber offers an opportunity to gain more insight into the candidates running for office. For Bridget and Matt, it's not easy to run for public office. As you know, it's a daunting task. Thanks to both of you for having the courage and desire to serve the town. Gilbert is an important community for SRP. Many customers may think of SRP when they turn on their lights, but our history and origins began in 1903 before we had power. It was when SRP started bringing water to the valley and to the farmers in Gilbert. I'd like you to think about the water that you see flowing through the SRP canals in Gilbert, or if you visit any of the lakes on the Salt and Verde rivers. Um, that's where SRP's water supply and much of the water from Gilbert is stored, but that water starts high up in the mountains in northern and eastern Arizona. We take our job as stewards of the Waters Area water supply very seriously. And as we've been experiencing the smoke in the air and reading in the news about wildfires in Arizona and also in California, it brings attention to the fact that it's critical to maintain a healthy forest, not only to present forest fires, but to protect our region's water supply. SRP, SRP is not only in the valley, we're also up in the mountains and partnering with other organizations to keep the forest healthy and protect that precious watershed. If you're interested in the information about where much of your water comes from, you can visit srpnet.com forward slash watershed. Online, you can tour the salt and verde watersheds and river system and see firsthand how water is carried to people in the valley. You'll also learn what SRP is doing to protect against drought, wildfires and climate change, and how we work to ensure we have enough water for years to come. Again, that website is srpnet.com forward slash watershed. Finally, from all of us at SRP, enjoy today's program and thank you for participating. Thank you to Linda and SRP for their ongoing support of our good government events. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's candidate forum, Paul Mariniak. Paul is a veteran journalist and proven newsroom leader with more than four decades in daily newspapers, half of which involved management positions in newsrooms of major metro papers. We appreciate Paul's coverage of Gilbert and his dedication to delivering news and information impacting our town's residents over the years. Please welcome today's moderator, Paul Mariniak of Times Publications. Hello, everybody. Hello, candidates. Um, first, we'll start with, uh, I'm going to pull a name, and we'll see who goes first with a, uh, an introduction, followed by the uh, other candidate. And Matt, 
I drew your name first, so you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Linda and Sarah as well and the chamber. I appreciate your time and, and appreciate the opportunity to come and, and uh, chat with everyone. So thank you. My name is Matt Nielsen. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my wife and four kids live here in Gilbert, and we love it. It's a great town, and uh, we look forward to many more years here. Um, quick introduction, I uh, have a bachelor's degree in communications. I have a master's degree in negotiation and dispute resolution. And for the past 20 years, I've been working in the private sector in a variety of industries, including as a small business owner. Uh, I decided to run for mayor of Gilbert because I love this town, as I mentioned before. Uh, and I wanna see good things happen here for our residents, my neighbors and, and your neighbors and you. Um, my priorities for, uh, for the, my mayorship are uh, threefold and certainly a lot more, but just a, a quick overview of the top three would be first and foremost, um, safe communities. And uh, that means something different today in 2020 than it did in maybe last year or certainly five or 10 years ago. Safe communities means that we fund our first responders appropriately, that they have the uh, equipment that they need, that they have the staff that they need, and I'm a strong supporter of them and I appreciate their service. Secondly, a uh, priority for me is that we get back to work. And uh, I think we can do that quickly and, and effectively and certainly safely uh, soon. Today, certainly again, 2020 is a very different world than, uh, than what, it, what prior years have been. And lastly, fiscal responsibility. We need to take care of uh, the money that we take in through taxes and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Bridget, your Thank turn. You. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to the Gilbert Chamber of Commerce and the Gilbert Sun News, SRP, and all of the sp sponsors. My name is Bridget Peterson and my family and I made Gilbert our home 25 years ago. My husband and I live in the same home we raised our family in and 24 la years later, it, our home is as perfect for us today as it was when we purchased it in 1996. Being part of the community was important to me, so I started by being a part of Gilbert Leadership, class eight, and later served on the Gilbert Leadership Board for seven years. That experience and encouragement an encouragement from Supreme Court Judge James Bean led me to serve as an appointed volunteer on the Gilbert Planning Commission for over 14 years. Running for election was something I never expected to be doing, but being part of building this community is the honor of a lifetime. Serving on the Gilbert Town Council since 2014 has given me the experience and background to be running for mayor today. During my time on council, I was lucky to serve on numerous boards and subcommittees on the local and national level. This gave me a wide perspective of all the different things Gilbert does that make our town unique and special. This also gave me a strong historical perspective of when, how, and why things were done. The relationships I've built throughout the community, in the East Valley, and all of the Phoenix metro area make me the uniquely qualified to serve as Gilbert Mayor. I have almost 20 years of private sector experience working for Raytheon in Massachusetts and Banner Health here in the East Valley. Those are two very different types of businesses. Raytheon as a government contractor gave me immeasurable knowledge of contracts, working on deadlines and working as a team. In fact, at 25, I was made supervisor of my group at Raytheon and even held a secret clearance with the federal government. Working for Banner Health really opened my eyes to how hospitals function, interacting with patients and guests gave me a great experience to work with my constituents here in Gilbert. Observing and understanding how the hospital works with our public safety and ambulance service came in very handy as a council member. My experience in the private sector and community involvement in Gilbert make me uniquely qualified for this role, and I hope to earn your vote to be the next mayor of Gilbert. Okay, <clears throat> we'll get started, but first a, a bit of a briefing for the audience. You'll see that I'll be holding up a yellow card to uh, signify to the candidates that they have 15 seconds to wrap up uh, uh, a statement or an answer. Uh, we're going to start our first uh, round of questions with Matt. Um, and Matt will have two minutes, followed by Bridget with two minutes, and Matt can avail himself of an extra minute after that, and then we'll be switching that around. During her time in office, Mayor Daniels had a clear desire to prevent Gilbert from experiencing municipal decline. 
which often happens as the community ages and residents and businesses leave. And that in turn causes tax revenue and quality of life uh, to degrade. Where do you stand on this philosophy and how do you propose to prevent stagnation and decline of Gilbert? Matt? Yeah, great question. It's, it's so important that we invest in our future. There's no question about it. Um, you know, and, and something that I've talked with groups about uh, at events in the past several weeks and even months um, is that we can and should retain and maintain the wonderful things that we all love about Gilbert into the future. But we can't do those, um, we, we shouldn't sacrifice those in order to move into the future. And what I mean by that is that um, we can grow and modernize and, uh, and take advantage of all the wonderful things that, that uh, intelligent and bright people around the world come up with in terms of technology and improvements to all kinds of systems, including infrastructure. Uh, we can take advantage of all of those things and move confidently into the future while still maintaining the wonderful things that we love about Gilbert. Um, and we all know what those are, the, the small town feel, the family friendly feel. You know, we have over 260,000 residents in this town, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like a small town. And so, yes, absolutely, we need to move into the future and modernize, uh, but we can do that and still maintain what's great about our town. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Paul. As we've seen, Gilbert's very good at moving forward. We have done a great job over the past 25, 30 years to handle the growth that we've had come from everybody wanting to move here to the Valley of Sun in the great state of Arizona. And Gilbert has done a great job handling all of that growth. We've even, I think, cut that growth over from what I had when I first moved here. They were projecting it 350,000 and we're projecting it 330,000 today. We are a very data-driven community. We do everything very fiscally responsibly and we want to use technology to move us into the future. One thing that I've learned from our current mayor is that or excuse me, our recently departed mayor, Jen Daniels, is that we're not planning for the time that I'm in office for the four years that I'm mayor. We're not planning for just the next 10 years that our general plan counts us out to. We're planning for the future. I'm not going to tie council members, current council members to things for that future, but I know how to take this town forward, move us forward, keep us moving forward, and do that in a very fiscal manner, and do that using modern technology, and do that by listening to our residents. I agree Agree that the thing that people love about this town is that it doesn't feel like it's 262,000 people that I can go to Liberty Market for breakfast and run into people that I know that feeling comes from having a mayor that is completely engaged and out there in the public and our council members also I served over 60 hours a month out at meetings and events in this town as a council member because I wanted to make sure that people knew me and that they were going to see me and that's what I hope to carry into the future for the town of Gilbert. Thank you. Matt, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I, I would just say maybe just one last thing. And I think that, um, you know, that we can retain those wonderful things about Gilbert um, without uh, sacrificing growth. Uh, I get that question a lot, actually. What are you going to do about all the apartments? That's probably the number one question that I get from anybody and everybody around town, regardless of political persuasion, by the way. Uh, that's the number one question. And so my answer to that always is that, uh, one, the general plan creates the, created a lot of what's going on today. Um, and so it's important to plan for the future. We need to make sure that we, we get all of that correct. But, um, but we can keep and maintain those wonderful things into the future as well without sacrificing those things. So Thank that's you. what I'm at. Thank you. Um, Bridget, we'll start with you with this next question. In recent years, Gilbert attracted major employers, including the world headquarters of Isagenics International, Silent Air, Northrop Grumman, and many other notable firms. However, Filling jobs within these industries continues to be a challenge. As mayor, how would you support workforce development efforts? 
And where would you ensure Gilbert continues to be a market where current and future businesses want to invest? Well, we need to make sure that we are working with our Chamber of Commerce like we have been. And the Tours for Teachers is a perfect example of that. We're bringing the teachers together with the business owners to make sure that the teachers here what the workforce need is for the future from those companies. I recently did the chamber red carpet tour. I say recently, boy, it was February, but it seems like ages ago, I, I guess at this point with COVID this year, but we toured the headquarters where Silent Air was, which was significantly smaller than it is today and where it's moved to in Gilbert down at Gilbert and the 202 they were able to take that business and expand it within our community. And then we take teachers into their community and we take other businesses into their business so that they can see exactly what's needed. We also work with the MIAC students to talk about what the workforce looks like here in Gilbert, what their opportunities are for the future, how we want them to go to college and go out and maybe even live someplace else, but come back to Gilbert when you're ready to start a family and build your home and live here into the future with your kids and enjoy that beautiful regional park that we're working on. We need to, I was very impressed when I went to the final event for Tours for Teachers this year because they talked about the information that they brought back to their students and how it's just as important for the students to learn that there are a lot of jobs out there that are gonna take certifications and maybe some general training and not necessarily four years of college because we have a lot of students that aren't necessarily college material or don't want to go to college at this point, but we need welders and plumbers and things that you can go get a certification for. I wanna continue those discussions because I think it's very important for people to know that. And if, you, if you're having trouble affording college at the moment, it's a great way to get started and get out into the workforce and get those employees that we really need here in the town too. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, so workforce, workforce development is an issue that is just, it's always perennially, it's top of mind for every municipality. It's something that every municipality, if they're smart, will prioritize and, and take care of to make, and foster to make sure that the economy in the area does thrive and grow into the future. So um, first and foremost on that, of course, is education. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of school choice and the opportunity for every child to get the education that best meet, meets their needs, regardless of what those are. Uh, and if those, we're so fortunate to have such wonderful district schools here in Gilbert that are operated well, they are full of wonderful, caring uh, teachers and administrators who love the children that we all send there. Of course, we have, we're fortunate as well to have options. We can go send our kids to a charter school or a private school through an ESA even. Uh, so, so many blessings, so many opportunities for kids to get the skills that they need. We need to continue that and even grow it. And I love that I'm gonna have the opportunity to work with all of these folks to make sure that that happens into the future for our town and for the kids in our town. Uh, the second thing that I'll mention on workforce development is that trust and competence breed confidence. And what I mean by that is that as we have potential new uh, employers looking at Gilbert to, to locate here and to add jobs, uh, I'm committed to working with those folks uh, and building relationships of trust with them. And I'm, and I'm very fortunate to have worked the past 20 years building up my competence to hopefully build that trust with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, do you have anything to uh, add to that? No, I think I'm good, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Well, for the benefit of the audience, we've uh, uh, put in a couple of uh, questions that only need a brief answer because we wanted you all to know a little bit about the personalities of uh, the two candidates for mayor. And so uh, this is uh, my first question on that. Um, and um, Matt, we'll start with you. What do you miss that no longer exists in Gilbert? That no longer exists in Gilbert. Well, um, we, are, we are approaching build out. As you know, it was mentioned that in the next 10 years, we'll have, uh, we'll have basically you know, no open space, farm fields. You know, I mean, that's, that's one thing that I'd say. I like, 
open spaces. Um, I recognize that I can't take that away from from people that want to build a home there, and and I uh, and I absolutely respect their right to to build on what their uh, on their properties what they will. But um, I like open open spaces. We're fortunate though to be able to drive not too far and find plenty of open space. So uh, I'm I'm excited about the growth that we're seeing in Gilbert. Hey, how about you, Bridget? What do you miss that no longer exists in Gilbert? I love everything that we've done with Gilbert and how we've progressed over the past 25 years since I've been here. To, the only thing that I could even say that I maybe missed is the fact that we had less traffic at one point in time. And obviously with growth comes more traffic, but it's gonna be a focus of mine as we move forward. And it, it just, you know, you used to be able to hop in your car and get any place in like five minutes. And now we obviously have more residents and I love that they're here. And I appreciate that they decided to come and make Gilbert their home just like I did. And so I appreciate that fact at the same time. Okay, well, the next, uh... Uh, question. Uh, we'll start with Matt. You have two minutes, followed by Bridget in two minutes. The town of Gilbert continues to increase in population. However, housing inventory is low, median home values continue to rise, and according to the general plan, Gilbert's housing options include 13.8% multifamily as compared to 86.2% single family. Some residents express concern that Gilbert is developing too many multifamily options, as Matt uh, noted a moment ago. And uh, resident John DeGrassi wondered, in light of growing traffic congestion and the need to responsibly use water available to us, what are your positions regarding council's approval of apartment buildings within the town? Matt. Yeah, so again, I, I get this question all the time and, and maybe uh, I, I might have heard it worded that exact way it, uh, uh, several times just because I hear it so much. Um, but it, it's so important. There are a couple of issues here and, and there are a lot of dynamics that play into this. Of course, the general plan outlines a lot of what's going on and, and this was determined. Again, we ratified the you know Prop 430 on the ballot in August, this last August. Uh, when the voters approved it. The voters approved that uh, about two thirds to one third. And so uh, the general plan sets in stone the, the general outlook for, for how land will be used into the future. Now, a lot of the land, parcels of land uh, within the general plan that are open, those have already been zoned. The only time that um, those things can be changed is when, uh, I apologize, the only time that those will come before the town council for a vote would be if there's a change that needs to be made. So uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question because it, there are so many dynamics that play into it. The, the main issues here are that one, the general plan has outlined a lot of this already and, and that is what it is. Two, specific plots of land are already zoned in a particular way. And three, property rights are of utmost importance for me. At the same time, you have to balance that against what I said earlier, my priority is to keep Gilbert, keep that small town feel and keep it family friendly. So uh, there are a lot of issues at play here. I'll, I'll say short and sweet, the best answer here is uh, every diff every situation is different, and it depends, and we have to take those on a case by case basis. Okay, Bridget. Thanks, Paul. That question is asked quite a lot, and um, I know that people see a lot of multifamily being built all at the same time. And I will tell you that it's all coming up out of the ground at the same time because the economy was doing so well. And they, the developers were able to come in and finally develop that land. The general plan is a guideline for the future of Gilbert and it lays out the zoning and it does show eventually potentially 13% multifamily. Let's put that in perspective with the towns and cities around us. Chandler, which is right beside us, our sister city, I like to call them because we're so close with them, 
They're very similar in size, land mass wise. They're very similar in population today. Today, they already have over 19% multifamily in their town built and developed. The, ch the plans can change into the future. People that own that land can come forward and make a request to change the zoning that is currently on land that is zoned multifamily to change it to something else, or they can come in and ask to change something else to multifamily. That's when the council will get to make a decision. But until then, it's all laid out in that general plan. And I'm happy to have those discussions with anybody. Okay, Matt, did you have anything to add? I don't, thanks Paul. Okay. All right, we'll start with Bridget. Uh, Mesa officials have uh, several times in public accused Gilbert of dumping its homeless population on their city. How do you respond to that? And is Gilbert sufficiently addressing the homeless issue? And how should it plan for a possible tsunami of evictions and foreclosures that could be in the wings as uh, early as this winter? Uh, Bridget, you're first. Thanks, Paul. I did. I sat on the, the MAG Human Services Committee, so I heard this discussion firsthand about the homeless in the valley and, and the issues that we have. And annually, there is a homeless count done for the whole valley. Um, residents and, and, and members of the town staff will go out one day a year, and they will count all the homeless. And I know that sounds almost crude in a way, but it's the best way to kind of get a handle on how many people are here in our towns and cities. Gilbert, this past year, I believe they counted nine homeless in Gilbert. We do share a border with Mesa. I love my Mesa city officials. I have very close relationships with them. It's very difficult to say that we're pushing our homeless over their borders when we share borders with Mesa, Chandler, Queen Creek. I think it's very important that we stay on top of that issue. It's very important that we watch our families as we're coming out of this COVID situation and see where the need is. And as the AZ CARES Act funds are being discussed by the current subcommittee, I'm hoping that that's something that they may discuss also. Okay, thank you, Matt. I... So, Paul, I had a great conversation with some folks here in town. Um, I want to say it was last week, early last week, um, and uh, leaders of local churches, and in particular, a couple of downtown, in the downtown area, and they work every day. I've been so impressed with the just giving, uh, the, uh, the willingness to give and share and work for the benefit of those who are in most need. Um, we talked for a good long time about this particular issue. And I'm, I'm excited to work with those people more to, to make sure that those who uh, are in need are getting the need that they help, uh, the, the help that they need is the better way to say that. Um, and, and especially for those who just need a hand up that are, are looking for a little bit of help, a bridge from here to, to their next meal or to a good job uh, or good training as a you know, precursor to that job. They, there are just so many wonderful people in our town that are doing a lot of great work on behalf of those folks. And uh, I've just been so impressed with them. I look forward to working more with them and, and helping them as well. Thank you. Bridget, did you have anything to add? Yes, I do. Thank you. I thought you had held up the yellow card, so I thought I was done. I want to add that at this time, Gilbert doesn't have any place for those homeless to go. The homeless shelters are all in different cities. And that is one reason that I'm sure Mesa feels that we are pushing our homeless over the boundaries to them. We don't have those advantages here in Gilbert at the moment to be able to offer that hand up. The council has been very, very strict and forthcoming when it comes to being absolutely fiscally responsible and not providing a lot of those services. I would be very open to having those discussions. I think it's time as we grow and we face build out. We finally opened our heritage center that provides services services to the people in Gilbert that do have some needs, dental needs, Mikasa, different needs like that, mental health needs. And I think it's very important that we continue that work. And those churches that Matt referred to are doing a great job because we just don't have those facilities here in Gilbert to handle that. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a uh, brief uh, question for the two of you. And uh, we'll start with Bridget. Uh, do you favor Proposition 207, the Recreational Marijuana Initiative? 
Mm, that's an interesting question. I have so many supporters that are really very pro medical, I mean, pro marijuana use. And I have so many that are against it. Personally, I don't like to vote for initiatives in the state of Arizona because they lock us into things for the, for the future. We can't do anything about it. The legislature can't do anything about it. The governor can't do anything about it. So trying to um, make an issue or solve an issue, if you will, by doing an initiative is just not the right way to do it. And I would be voting no on Prop 207. But I know a lot of people that are really in support of that. Okay, Matt, where do you stand on Prop 207? Yeah, I'll, I'll vote no on 207. Okay. All right, uh, we do have a question for each of you uh, uh, that uh, uh, is directed specifically at you, and you have three minutes uh, on this. And Matt, uh, you're first in the batter's box. Um, you say that your default position is no new taxes. How practical is that stance given the economic impact of COVID-19 uh, may not hit the budget until next year? and Gilbert still needs to develop infrastructure to accommodate growth. Yeah, so um, infrastructure obviously is, is the, uh, you know, second maybe to public safety is the primary responsibility of local government. So we have to have wastewater systems. We have to have water delivery systems. We have to have an, uh, electrical and, and um, we have to have, make all of those available to our utility partners. We have to have roads built. And so all of that is absolutely must be done. Um, I would, uh, and, and I look forward to doing this, I, I welcome the opportunity to work with town staff to see where we can make any adjustments to be as efficient and effective as possible in how we manage those budgets uh, to make sure that we're not being irresponsible with tax money. And uh, I, I, I say in there, anytime I talk about taxes, yes, my default position is no new taxes. I'm willing to have those conversations, but the responsibility to justify new taxes will be on the person who's making those proposals or group who's making those proposals. I won't be out front advocating for new taxes. I won't do that. I will have those conversations and and uh, and with an open mind and make sure that we're you know we're being responsible with the money that we take in as a first priority. Okay, all right. For Bridget, you we have um, a separate question for you. You base your campaign on your track record and leadership abilities. Um, can you discuss an initiative that you originated on council and explain how it impacted the community? Hmm. Something that I originated on council, making me use my long-term memory here. I can't think of an initiative that I initiated on council, but several that I was part of. And that would be, um, I think the most recent that's going to have the most impact into the future is the refresh of the land development code. And I served as the chair of the subcommittee on that. I think my history on planning commission and with the general plan going on at the same time and being on the steering group for the general plan, we were able to really take a deep, deep dive. And when I say deep, we met every two to three weeks for almost 18 months to go through that land development code. We wanted to make it easier to do business in here. We Here in Gilbert, we wanted to make it more efficient and effective to do business here in Gilbert. We wanted to make it easier on our residents when they wanted to look something up in our land development code. How do they find those things? I have people ask me those questions all the time and I can direct them to those places easily. I can also say that we wanted it to be easier for um, staff to use that land development code when an applicant, a developer or a resident came to them and said, we want to do this in town. What do we need to be able to do? And they can refer them right to the land development code and it's easy to use and, and friendly to use. And that was a goal of mine too. And so that's one that I really did a really deep dive on and took a, a lot of pride in too. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a short uh, question here. Uh, what restaurant in Gilbert is your favorite place for dinner? Matt, you can uh, take a first crack at that. So this is a great question and it's a tough one 
because I'm always finding new places that, um, that just have amazing food. Um, I'm going to go with, last time I was asked this, I answered Joe's Farm Grill and it's up there. It absolutely is because they have amazing food. I love that place. Um, this time, I think I'll say I, Surf City Sandwich. It's a new shop on Power Road just south of Ray. So if you're in that area and you want an amazing sandwich, Paul and his crew over there make an amazing pastrami on rye. So if you like pastrami, that's the spot. It's amazing. All right, Bridget, how about you? So for me, it's really going to depend on what mood I'm in. And if I want Chinese, I'm going to Dragon Walk. And if I want poutine, I'm going to Union Grill and Tap. If I want pizza, I'm going to Sal's Pizza on Gil uh, uh, Gilbert Road. It, so it really depends on what I'm in the mood for. If I want my favorite barbecue, I'm going to Joe's Barbecue. Okay. Well, I've made a note to myself on all your <laughs> recommendations. So I thank you. Uh, the next question, we're going to start out with uh, uh, Matt. There have been weekly protests for the past couple of months at Warner and Gilbert Roads by pro-police and Black Lives Matter groups. Mm -hmm. The listening session the town held in June hasn't resolved underlying problems in the community. What is your solution to mend the rift out there? And should the town bring back the Human Relations Commission? And if not, why not? And uh, Matt, that's your turn. Yeah, uh, so that I'll take that last question on first because I think there's a lot of good that can come from something like the Human Relations Commission. Uh, I, I understand that there were reasons why that was uh, ultimately disbanded. Um, I actually read up on that. I talked to people who were involved in it directly. And uh, in a lot of ways, it was unfortunate the way that that actually happened and, and the details of who actually initiated that, that disbandment. However, uh, what I will say is that um, I think, you know, my, my undergraduate degree is in communications and it's in interpersonal and small group communi communications. I learned a lot from that. Um, I'm not perfect on that. I, I am always working to get better and, and do better uh, as far as that goes. But I will say that there's so much value in just communicating, you know, and talking with rather than past or to people. Uh, those conversations have got to happen. And I think we need to find a vehicle, uh, a mechanism to help those conversations happen. And I'm absolutely uh, not just willing, but I, I'm excited to figure out what, how to get there you know, how to make, how to facilitate those conversations so that everyone feels valued. Uh, mutual respect is a big, big deal. We've got to get there. And I'm committed to moving in that direction. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Paul, great question and great timing. Tuesday night at the Gilbert Council meeting, the council discussed this already, and I had already been discussing this issue with um, Council Member Tilke and Council Member Spence about bringing the group back, but we're going to name it, talking about some, meaning, naming it something different. So the Community Relations Board and um, Jared Taylor gave a great explanation as to how the board went away several years ago. We were in the process of looking at and redesigning and merging together all the boards and commissions within the town. And it just happened to be one that didn't seem to have a clear focus at the time. And it was one of the ones that we decided as mayor and council that we would um, put on a hiatus. And now is the time to bring it back. I haven't actually seen any results or conversations or discussions that came out of those learning sessions. But I also didn't want this to wait until January when I'm mayor to start this discussion. I wanted this discussion to start now. I want that board to be brought back now so that they can show the people in Gilbert that those learning session discussions are actually moving forward to a group and to bring all of those people together. I know I met with Chief Solberg just um, two weeks ago and we talked about the fact that he's been meeting with the leaders of all of those groups. I believe our council members have been meeting with the members of those groups because they want to bring everybody together. They want to find out what people page everybody's on and have a have, let them have a voice and let them have that discussion within the town of Gilbert and find out exactly what we can do here in Gilbert to help those groups as we move forward as a community. Matt, did you have anything to add? 
I do, yeah. I'll just mention that um, several weeks ago, I formed a couple of committees, advisory committees, that have been super helpful to me and, and I think will be uh, good, good models to use going forward uh, during my time as mayor. Um, first is the community and, and the relevant committee here advisory committee is the Community Relations Advisory Committee, and we have representatives on this committee from faith groups, as well as nonprofit groups from throughout the town. And all of these folks come from a very diverse background. I'm so fortunate to have been able to, to meet these people and to work with them over the past several weeks to talk about these issues that are pressing and that are on everyone's minds. And so uh, we're working now to, to develop at the grassroots level, which is really where this uh, is going to have the most effect, um, to, to figure out how we communicate best with each other and to make sure that happens into the future. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, we're going to start with Bridget, and it comes from Gilbert resident Maria Hess. Uh, and uh, I quote, a great education system is inextricably linked to a qualified workforce and a strong economy. What are your thoughts on how the town of Gilbert can support our K-12 and higher education institutions? So Bridget? That's a great question for Maria Hesse since she's with ASU. Um, I think that we do a great job making sure that we reach out to our education community. I have been in constant contact with four of the five members of the Gilbert Public Schools Board. I'm in contact with members of the Hagley Unified School Board. I am in contact with members of the Chandler School Board and um, people that are running for those boards also and making sure that I'm getting out to meeting them. The mayor put into effect a mayor's advisory committee for education that she brings in leaders from K through 12 and higher education. And I would like to continue that. I think that the only way that we can help each other is to make sure that all the members are are at the table and I know that she's brought in members from charter schools and our higher ed and of course now we're proud to have Park University down in our university building and the U of A nursing college in our university building so we definitely want to make sure that we're pushing our workforce to those institutions to be and I, we know healthcare is always going to need nurses that's one thing that will never go away as we move forward as an as a society and we need to make sure that those kids know that they can get that education right here in Gilbert and I want to continue those discussions and make sure that we move forward together people often get very confused that the mayor and council don't have a say over any of the school districts within our community and I think we're unique having three school districts within our community but we have 80,000 school age children they're all able to go to any school that they want to. We have a great charter school system. We have great private schools. And again, we have great higher ed right here in our community. And I want to see us work together to make sure that everybody knows the advantages that they have. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, uh, great question. I, um, pa I'm passionate about, I mentioned this before, about uh, education choice. Uh, because of that, I actually founded a nonprofit organization that deals just with that. It's called the Educational Freedom Institute. And I'm the board chair at that, at that nonprofit. And we're proud to advocate for the best education for every child, regardless of what their needs are and regardless of the provider, because the child is the priority. And I, I wanna reiterate that we have, we're so fortunate to have wonderful school districts that serve our children here in this area. We have, uh, you know, even as was mentioned, charter schools and private schools, but even a very strong homeschool co-op network and multiple homeschool networks here in the town of Gilbert. And different children require different types of education, different approaches, and every educator knows that. And so I'm just, I'm grateful to have so many committed educators in our community that, are, that prioritize the education of each child. And so it's a great question. We've got to continue to foster that because that is what leads to everything else in the town. It leads to workforce development, which we already talked about. It leads to a strong economy, which is an outgrowth of that workforce development. So education has to remain a top priority. And we don't have a lot of control at the town level over 
uh, school districts, school charter schools, private schools, of course, any of those, but we can and we should, and I will work with educators from each of those sectors to make sure that we're taking care of those kids' needs. Okay, thank you. Bridget, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd just like to add one thing. When Deloitte was looking at coming to Gilbert, they looked at a couple of things specifically. And one of their, one of their comments was that we have three really great school districts. I couldn't be more proud of the level of education that our district schools do within this community and then all of the other opportunities that are afforded our students with charter schools and homeschooling and private schools. I think we really need to keep that in mind. So when a big company like Deloitte is looking at your town, education is going to be one of their main focal points. And our heritage district was the other, was one of the other top three. So I'm really proud of that too. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Uh, this is one of those uh, quickie questions, and it's related to the uh, question I just asked. Um, and Matt, we'll start with you. Do you feel a four-year degree is required for success in the 21st century? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, and this goes back to what I just said earlier. You know, every child has different needs. Um, we all we're all different people, right? I mean, I, it's interesting. I was talking with some folks. Um, that work with kids in the CTE programs in our schools here locally. And um, you can graduate now with a certificate in welding as a high school senior and make close to two times more than what your teacher was making as an entry level welder. Uh, of course, you have certificates that you earn along the way and, and, and as you graduate with those certificates, but upon graduation, it's possible to make close to double what your teacher made. Uh, and that's not just welders, by the way, plumbers. Uh, right out of high school with these certificates that are available through these wonderful programs at our schools can earn a lot of money. They can earn really good money. And that's not a four year degree, but it's an absolutely worthwhile and valid profession to, to work toward and to, to hold as a career throughout your life. And, uh, and we need those people. We've got to have people that with skills in our, in our town. Is a four-year degree valuable? No question. I have one myself. I have a master's degree in addition to that. And uh, I commend anyone who feels that that's the, the right path for them to do it. Uh, there's a lot of value there, but that, that does not... Um, mean that everything else is not valuable. We, we have a great need for people with those hard skills. Okay, Bridget, your thoughts? Yeah, I've had this conversation with students even. We took um, some high school students on a tour and had them meet some people here in Gilbert and have this discussion because they weren't sure what they were going to do or what their path was going to be. And one of the people that we sat down with is uh, one of the owners and chef at Liberty Market. And he very quickly told them that he didn't have a degree and how he had made his way through life to own this beautiful restaurant and to be a very successful and popular chef here in Gilbert. And I think they were very surprised at that. And then I was able to sit down with them and have a discussion with them about the fact that I do not have a four-year degree. I have all of my life experience and all of the jobs that I've held that have taught me everything that I know about this community and about leadership and about life. And I think that there are opportunities out there for everyone. And as long as you make the most of the opportunity that you're given, you can do anything that you want, whether or not you have that four degree, a certification, or whatever it happens to be. And maybe later on in life, you choose to go and do those things too, when you have a little more time or a little more money, shall we say. But I think that um, today, anybody can do anything that they want here, here as an American. Okay, thank you. Uh, for our next question, we're gonna start with Matt. And uh, this comes from Gilbert resident, Linda Baedeker who said that the Gilbert Farrell Cat Coalition recently sent, uh, apparently both of you, information on the Trap Neuter Return Program, a, human, a humane method of controlling homeless and feral cats. And it's being used in Mesa, Chandler, Tempe, Phoenix, and in many other communities in Arizona and the United States. Do you support 
a volunteer TNR program in Gilbert to humanely limit the number of uh, cats in the community? Yeah, I, di I did get that questionnaire and we had a, a good email exchange on that. Um, I think that, uh, and I understand by the way, this is a, a question that's come up in the past. Those who have followed um, town council meetings for uh, in detail will know that this has come up in the past uh, to town government. Um, and I recognize that there are different issues to consider in this regard. You know, there are residents that don't want uh, cats being fed near them because it's it can be loud at night when cats are uh, outside and and they people don't like cats roaming around. So I understand that there are different issues there, but um, I'm I also recognize the benefits of a TNR program, and so <clears throat> I think it's something that we have to take another close look at and make sure that we get all of those details right. But but I think that there's room to make a program like that work. We just have to have those conversations and figure out what the best way is to approach that going forward. Okay, Bridget? Hi, yes, I've um, spoken to several members of that coalition and we've discussed the fact that I would be open to having that discussion once I'm mayor in January. I wanna see the data that they can bring me for the TNR programs and what it's been doing in the cities and towns around us. And I also um, <laughs> just adopted my own little kitten who had a feral mom that was picked up to be a TNR and when they trapped her to take her off to be spayed they found out that she was expecting and so in the midst of this whole election process I brought Stanley home to join us and I've had that discussion with the group also because I think it's very important for us to do our part in any different way that we can. I do have a lot of discussions with residents about the feral cat situation because we have so many cats roaming around the community they're free range animals sometimes people don't understand that dogs are licensed dogs are home with you you know where they are if you call the dog catcher because there's a dog roaming around they will come out but with cats they're free range so they don't come out for those kinds of situations so we have to find a way that works better for the community and I really am looking forward to having those conversations with them Matt did you have anything to add I don't thank you okay. we'll switch now um, away from wildlife to uh, uh, town government again, and uh, we're going to start with Bridget on this one. Uh, Gilbert resident Kevin Baudreau um, says that uh, you basically will have a whole new town council in January. How do you develop cohesiveness and trust quickly among council members? And then how do you get staff and citizen trust? That's a great question. And it's something that I've been talking about all this time as I've been running for mayor because we will have quite a different, we already have quite a different council there. I have already developed relationships with the current council members that were appointed. I have been meeting regularly with council member Spence, council member Kaprowski, or excuse me, vice mayor Kaprowski, council member September. And I plan to reach out to council member Hendricks. I haven't had that opportunity yet, but I want to be able to do that now so that I can and build those relationships so that when I get in there in January, we can hit the ground running. It's very interesting being the new person coming on the council. I've been there, I've done that, and I've worked with two new council members as they've come onto the council. And being that one and only person, it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting situation, which I was when I came on in 2015. And then Scott Anderson was the only new person that came on in 2015. 16 and then or 17 in January and then um, council member Yentes was the only new person to come out after the 2018 election. It's very interesting to be in that situation. I think it's very important to build those relationships. I already have the relationships with staff. I already have very many relationships with our school districts, our school boards, and a lot of our residents and the Chamber of Commerce, for instance, SRP, the newspapers like yourself, Paul, and I plan to just work to do whatever necessary to keep building those relationships. Okay, Matt? Yeah, great question, uh, Paul. The, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my um, formal education is in communications, so my undergrad and my master's degree is in negotiation and dispute resolution, which I'm told is, can come in handy from time to time in elected office. And so um, I look forward to, to working with people and building those relationships of trust. I, 
certainly have great relationships with uh, several town council members and, and uh, have had wonderful conversations uh, in depth with, with several of them. Uh, I will say that it, it, it's important to note that while all of us won't agree on everything all of the time, we can still trust one another. We all know people that we don't agree with on many things, but we trust them because they're honest brokers, because they're transparent, because they're forthright. What they say is what they actually mean. And that's something that I will, uh, I will work for work. I absolutely am looking forward to working with them and building those relationships of trust. And not just with the council, again, many of whom I have great relationships with and, and know well, uh, others I don't. But those, that formal training that I have in my education, as well as the past 20 years in the private sector, the, as I continue to work in private organizations and leading teams, leading organizations, those things have served me well. And, and I look forward to doing that uh, during my time as mayor. Okay, thank you. Bridget, do you have anything to add? I have had relationships and known Councilmember Tilkey for 23 years. I've known Council Mayor Scott Anderson for over 20 years. I have been currently working with the majority of the council now as we move forward. I have relationships in this community through the Gilbert Leadership Program that have trained me for situations just like this as we, as we move forward and take this seat. And I think it's super important that it is somebody that this community knows and has a recognizable face and somebody that has a voting record that they can trust and depend on. Okay, thank you. Matt, we're going to start with you on this one. This, uh, uh, and, and this is only a, a yes or no or a brief statement if you care to make it. Councilman member elect uh, Lauren Hendricks sued the town of Gilbert uh, before taking a seat on town council to take a seat a, a, a little earlier ahead of January. The lawsuit uh, came at the expense of taxpayers who uh, paid to defend the town and uh, the town clerk. Uh, and the judge's ruling does allow uh, Mr. Hendricks to be seated uh, uh, in November, uh, about three meetings prior to when he uh, would have been seated in January. Uh, do you support uh, uh, Mr. Hendricks' decision to sue the town at taxpayers' expense, uh, Matt? Uh, yes, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the law was stated clearly in state statute that elected leaders should be should take their seats when an appointed person is occupying that seat and the judge ruled that way and the the law is the law and uh, I think we probably could have done a little better job of making sure we understood that before we made commitments to people who were appointed. Okay, thank you. Um, Bridget. Thank you. Interesting question. I would say that um, because we're a town, we don't fall under the law that the state has uh, written out for everybody else. And I think that that will probably become an issue in the next legislative session, or will have to be an ordinance with each town within the state of Arizona. Under the situation, what they found was a loophole that um, you can be seated because the state law doesn't speak to a town holding their elected officials until January, like we do at the federal level and the state level, and like we've done for over 20 years here in Gilbert. We've had this precedent set in Gilbert before in 2016 when Mayor Lewis stepped down and we appointed Jen Daniels to be mayor of Gilbert. We filled her seat for six months. She was That seat was filled by James Candland. He was appointed to that seat. And when Scott Anderson was elected in August, he probably could have asked for the same thing. I think some of it comes down to a precedent that's set in the community. I give it. I give Mr. Hendricks credit for taking the initiative and to finding a loophole like this. And I think it's something that we will have to move forward and correct into the future because we have followed a precedent and we've set a setting for the town of Gilbert for over 20 years. And I would have just assumed that we just continue to follow that under this under these circumstances. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt, we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, this comes from a resident who says, uh, uh, we say that the mayor's office is a part-time job, but it really isn't. Some former mayors have quit their other jobs to fulfill the duties of mayor. 
serving as Gilbert mayor uh, is much more than attending a couple of council meetings a month. The mayor represents the town on regional boards and committees and uh, attends many community events. Will you be able to devote 30 to 40 hours or more a week to this position? Yeah, I'm fortunate to have a lot of flexibility at work. I have a lot of wonderful and, and appreciated support from my colleagues and coworkers, and I have no doubt, and, and I work very close. I, I, my commute is about five minutes from my house here in Gilbert. So I have plenty of uh, flexibility there, and, and I look forward to dedicating all of the time necessary to make sure that the, the mayor's seat is filled uh, effectively and, uh, and well. Okay, Bridget? Um, that's a great question, and it's something that concerns me because I have watched John Lewis serve this community as mayor, and I have watched Jen Daniels serve this community as, as mayor, and I know for a fact that they haven't been able to hold full-time jobs otherwise, and it has affected them in many different ways. Our current mayor sits on eight different boards, including Phoenix Mesa Gateway. Our, our former mayor, Jen Daniels, was booked for 20 to hours a week for meetings and events, excluding council meetings, which would be additional two to five hours every other week. And then you have all of the emails, the calls, prepping for council meetings, other boards that you're, that you're on, and you're, you're expected to put probably 10 to 15 hours in for that. You're also expected to be available for evenings and weekends. And I have been to more church services in more church buildings on Sundays than I in the past five years than I have in my entire life because I would be invited for a veteran celebration or a patriotic celebration or just to come in and sit in our church and have a service with us. And then if you decide to take on any extra extra curricular situations like MAG, um, for example, that our mayor sat on or the league executive committee, those are able to give the town more influence within the region and state. And I think they're very important for us to be able to do. I'm very lucky to not work outside my home. I have such a great husband that is very open to supporting me in this. And as a council member, I was devoting 60 hours a month to meetings and events. And that didn't include my prep time, my travel time, my emails, my phone calls, or anything else. Some of our council packets, which the average person doesn't know, can be anywhere from 300 pages to 3,000 pages for one Tuesday night meeting. So there's a lot of work that, that goes into this, and I intend to do it in a full-time capacity. Okay, thank you, Matt. Did you have anything uh, to add? Uh, yeah, I'll just mention, you know, I over the past 20 years, I've been called on uh, on, a, at, on a regular basis to make sure that I'm being as effective and as, as efficient as possible with my time, given so many responsibilities, whether it's combination of the nonprofit organization that I chair, the um, responsibilities that I have at work and at home and, and with volunteer uh, opportunities that I've taken advantage of. And, and I'm confident that I'll have the capacity and the competence to do that. Gilbert deserves uh, a mayor that has the background, the expertise, the experience, and the know-how to get the job done right and to get, a get the job done well. Okay, thank you. Uh, for members of the audience, we advise the uh, candidates that uh, we would do something a little bit different uh, in this forum, uh, and we would have each candidate ask the other a question, and they have uh, three minutes to respond. And so, uh, Matt, uh, you're first in asking Bridget your question. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So, Bridget, my question for you is, could you help us to understand uh, by listing the positions you've held in a business in the past 15 years where you've held a leadership role that you feel prepared you to help businesses to succeed? Well, you know the answer to that question, Matt, because I haven't held a position in a business in the last 15 years. I've been in, totally involved in this town. Um, well, let's see, what year is this? 2000, so in 2009, I was working for Banner Health. So that would have been 11 years ago where I held a position. And I was also on the Town of Gilbert's Planning Commission at the same time. I had regular interactions with the CEOs from, the, from Banner Health and the different hospitals within that community since 
I was um, on the planning commission and we were at the time building Banner Gateway here in Gilbert and it gave me great experience. And then my former private sector life was at Raytheon where I had a lot of business experience. No, I don't have small business experience, but being on the town council or being mayor of this town does not require that. What you need is to be able to focus and to learn and to educate yourself to the current topics that are going on and to be able to just bring yourself up to date and to be able to answer those questions and to be able to sit back and listen and to learn. And that's the most important function that I can do as a mayor. Okay, and uh, now Bridget, it's your turn to ask uh, Matt a question. I didn't actually draft up a question, so I'm gonna pop one off the top of my head for something that I heard um, that Mr. Nielsen said, which was that he would discuss privatizing our garbage pickup hmm. here in Gilbert. Yeah, interesting question. Uh, it's come up before, um, but I haven't suggested it. Uh, I had heard that, I wanna say it was in 2012, um, a couple of town council members from Gilbert met with an individual who had done that for other municipalities in the state and had advised them through privatizing the trash pickup service. So um, I haven't advocated for that uh, and I haven't stated my position on it one way or the other. And to be honest, that's because I need to learn more about it. I need to understand it better. And, and I know that's why those two town council members met with that individual is to understand it better. Um, I have talked with people from the, that uh, part of the town organization, people that actually drive the trucks, had some great conversations with them and, um, and about their feelings about privatization because that did come up. And, um, and I need to understand that better before I could state a position on it. I know there are a lot of moving parts there, but, uh, but yeah, good question. Okay, well, uh, we're going to uh, move into closing remarks and uh, uh, because uh, Bridget took second uh, place in the opening remarks, she'll be the last to uh, give closing remarks. So Matt, uh, your final thoughts uh, as we wrap up this forum. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I just, I wanna say again, thank you so much to the chamber, to SRP and the other sponsors, Paul, certainly to you. Uh, appreciate everyone taking their time to make this forum available to the citizens of Gilbert. Uh, I have recently, over the past several weeks, been setting up events uh, in person and virtual, depending on how people are comfortable meeting, uh, just to get in front of people and to chat and talk. It's so important that the mayor is, is uh, in my mind, three things. Number one, accessible. I have a cell phone that rings the, to me. Uh, I carry it on me all the time. And I pick up those calls. And when I can't pick it up, I return those voicemails. Uh, in fact, I was late to the prep for this meeting because I was on a call with a resident that had called that phone and it went a little over time. So accessibility. Um, the, the next thing is responsiveness. That's returning those calls, returning those emails. And I've been so, uh, it's been so fun to just engage with people over the past several months since February when I declared my candidacy for this seat. So it's been great interacting with people around town, getting invited to people's small businesses to, to learn more about them and to take pictures and to, and to just connect with them. The last thing that I'll say that I feel is so important for this role as, as mayor is uh, forthrightness. That's the word that I'm looking for. I was gonna say transparency and that's important too, but uh, forthrightness carries a little more of a, of a message than just transparency. Uh, what you'll get out of me as your mayor here in Gilbert is forthrightness. I'm not going to tell you something to your face and then do something different behind your back or in a town council meeting. Uh, I certainly would not lie to you. What I will do is I will let you know what my position is and I value people with an open mind. And I try to foster that in myself and make sure that I'm keeping an open mind about different issues. And so, it, that I think has roots in my, uh, my undergrad degree, communications, just making sure, one of my professors would always say, be less sure. Uh, we can get so sure of ourselves on some things sometimes that we block out new information. 
and that's not me. I wanna make sure that you all know as citizens of Gilbert that I'm here, that I'm accessible, that I'm responsive, and that I'm forthright. So again, I appreciate your time. Uh, it's been great chatting with you, Paul. Thank you so much for, for moderating this. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the Chamber and SRP. All right, Bridget. Thank you, Paul. Thanks to the Chamber and SRP and all the sponsors again for hosting this. It's important for everybody to get out and vote and make sure you vote all the way down the ballot. During my time on the Gilbert Town Council, there wasn't a project that I didn't want to be involved, involved in. Uh, Gilbert is a leader when it comes to safety, affordability, and job growth. And my experience in history, being a part of building that is unmatched. I made a point to serve as a council member in a full-time capacity and will do so as mayor. Gilbert needs a full-time mayor that will be available to meet with residents, staff, business leaders, and stakeholders. I've been there for the difficult conversations. I've asked the tough questions and I have won some votes and I've lost some. Unlike my opponent, I have a voting record that proves that. I often don't agree with staff, the applicant, the public, or council members, but you will always know where I stand and why. I look at every situation independently from a logical perspective, not an ideological perspective. I have a long record of leadership in Gilbert that I'm proud of. I was there when we voted to pay off bonds early, saving taxpayers millions of dollars. I was there when we lowered our tax rate from 115 to 99 cents. I was there when we added thousands of high quality jobs and created a world-class downtown experience. I've protected public safety and commit to making sure our police and fire are trained for years to come. We need a mayor that can hit the ground running on day one. I'm the only candidate running that has served the citizens of Gilbert. If you want a mayor with passion and dedication, vote Bridget Peterson for mayor. If you love Gilbert, then I'm the proven choice. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Sarah for some closing remarks. I do want to personally thank uh, both candidates. Um, I wish you both luck in the coming uh, weeks and on November 3rd. And I'd also like to thank the residents who turned in such uh, great questions and made my uh, job a little easier. So with that, Sarah. Yes, so Matt, Bridget, thank you for your participation today. This dialogue is so important to our business community, so we're grateful for your time. To our viewers, please take a few minutes to visit our Chamber website at gilbert8z.com and click on the public policy link. You're going to find information there on um, each of the candidates and questionnaire responses for candidates running not only for the mayoral seat, but also for CD5, legislative districts 12 and 17, Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, districts one and two, and Higley Unified School District and more. And finally, to our moderator, thank you, Paul, for uh, leading today's conversation. You're such a pleasure to work with, and I'm always grateful for you. And with that, we are going to sign off. Thanks for joining us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.